you yeah, a little bit of history. Before Bluestream started, um, obviously back in 2010 when Valens first had um, released their chipsets, we saw this amazing technology called HD Base T and we, we brought a product out to market. Back then, um, the whole concept of HD Base T and the name uh, didn't, didn't really even exist. It was just a matter of sending a signal from one Valen, um, one transmitter to one receiver. Um, and very soon what we saw is that the entire industry um, was moving towards um, that particular technology and, um, and the importance of compliance came about. So, you know, how are we going to know that our transmitter is going to plug directly into an Epson projector, for example? So, compliance is a big issue and there's a lot of money involved in making sure that your product is going to work with every product in the market. Um, Additional to that, you've also got control systems. Um, you've got your guys that love push, guys that love RTI, guys that love press room. So we started to realise that a lot of resources needed to be ploughed into this into this product area, um, and large quantities of stuff needed to be to be um, acquired in order to give your customer a really good solution. Um, so we became one of the three um, founding distributors um, of, of Bluestream and it's been a, a fantastic um, ride and very successful for all, all of the distributors in the country. Um, I'm not going to steal your thunder this time, <laughs> there's been a number of very exciting jobs and one in particular um, that, that Daniel will talk about um, and it really goes back to you do your homework, you do your support customize your product um, and you're going to have um, a very happy end user and, and happy installers. Yeah, pass it across to Daniel. Thank you. All right, so thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to take you through um, HDMI and some of the uh, the new technologies coming out uh, with HDMI. I'm going to show you some new HD based TIG technologies as well and I'm going to take you through uh, Bluestream's new product offerings that will be coming to market in the coming months. Just a quick little blurb about Bluestream. Um, we've been around since uh, 2013. Our head office is based here in Melbourne. I'm sure you're aware um, our key focus is on the AV industry and distributing audio video signals um, and solving a lot of problems that you guys have with AV signals. Bluestream is a global company so we were founded and we originated here in Melbourne. Our head office and all our R&D is here in Melbourne. We have a, a UK office um, in uh, Nottingham in the UK. They also lead up all of our marketing and we have a European office in Madrid in Spain to handle um, between the UK and, and, and Madrid to handle our European operations. All of our manufacturing is either in China or Taiwan and we've recently or we have a total of 46 distributors uh, globally and in 27 countries across the world. So in a very short period of time with your support we've grown exponentially. So we've recently moved into a new factory in Shenzhen in China purely because of how quickly and how fast we've grown. Um, so this here is, is the new building um, and it's a, a state-of-the-art facility, much, much more improved, larger than, uh, than our previous offices. Um, just to show the commitment, I guess, that we got, we, we've gone to and the lengths that we've gone to um, to stay relevant and stay up to date in the, the consumer electronic market. We've gone out and bought a, an additional 80 new displays, various different displays, purely so that we can test, evaluate um, and confirm our product works with all of the latest TVs, all of the latest technologies. Um, also, all of our Matrix products, just to give you an example of the testing that we do before we, we ship out a product, 100% of our Matrix products go through functional testing on the production line. What does that mean? Every input, every output is hooked up to a real world source to confirm that it works. Um, IR inputs, outputs, 232, etc., all functions are tested before a unit leaves the production line. We also have what we call a soak test room. All of our products are soak tested. They're stored in this room for um, 24 hours, put on test. Uh, and this room is hotter than a, a Melbourne summer day. Very humid as well. Um, but this ensures that the product uh, uh, works under extreme conditions. So we test our products before they even get packaged, before they leave the warehouse. We're proud that we have 
um, a large, uh, very straightforward, simple integration with all of the major control systems available. So um, we have a full featured website and on our website you can find all of our manuals, all of our schematics, so example systems, um, and all of our drivers and protocols and all of those uh, two-way control modules, etc. to interface with other systems. They're all freely downloadable from our website. We also host interactive online tutorials and our UK team are currently um, headlining this and that's great because they start first thing in their morning, which is about 5.30 a.m., uh, sorry, 5.30 p.m. here. So if you guys ever want to sit in any of their training, you can jump online um, to our website and undertake uh, the Bluestream training there. Oops. Um, also, um, socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, jump on board if you like. If ever we're at a trade show, we're doing training, um, we share that information and, and keep you guys updated. We exhibited all the major trade shows, so ISC in Amsterdam, um, which was on in February, and Integrate in Australia. Um, we've recently undertaken many projects, many large-scale projects. Um, Marvel World in Thailand, um, uh, utilised some of our Platinum Matrix products, that's a, a new theme park, sorry. The Nokia Call Centre in India utilises uh, the multicast products, and the Opa Stadium in Perth also utilises the multicast system. A project we're most proud of is one that has recently been completed. I'm sure you've heard, you've all heard of the big stadium event that just took place in South Korea. Um, we're proud to announce that we had a nearly 900 strong um, endpoint system there. So almost 100 receivers, sorry, 100 transmitters, 100 different sources, 800 receivers, 800 different displays, all connected using our IP system, our multicast IP system. So a massive job that, um, that went absolutely flawlessly um, at the Winter Olympics. So not just a small name anymore, we're on a, a global scale here, very large jobs. Alright, so first off I want to take you through HDMI and understanding some of the new technologies that we're going to be presented with um, in the future. HDMI, as boring as it is, is a, a, a way of um, transmitting audiovisual uncompressed signals over a HDMI cable. There have been many different versions or formats of HDMI over the years. We're currently here at HDMI 2.0 and two of the features or headaches it brought with it, with it is HDCP 2.2 or increased security and 18 gigabit per second of bandwidth, so an increased data, increased bandwidth. We are, or as of uh, this month, the HDMI 2.1 specification was finalised. It was announced quite a while ago, but it was actually finalised this month. And it brings with it some new technologies and some new interesting features. Um, a key one is increased bandwidth. So HDMI 2.1 is designed to support 10K resolutions, well and truly beyond what we're currently seeing. And frame rates up to 120 hertz, much faster frame rates than we currently have. Some interesting points under the, the HDMI 2.1 specification. It can send now either uncompressed or compressed video distribution. Traditionally we've been dealing with uncompressed signals and now HDMI org has specified Visa DSC, a visually lossless method for compression. So HDMI 2.1 will feature compression. And this is interesting to note because HD Base T have also adopted this same compression method and I'll cover that. So some key features of HDMI 2.1, the biggest one being this beast here, bandwidth. We're stepping up from 18 gigabit per second of bandwidth provided by HDMI 2.0 to 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth a three times increase. This is a really interesting point as well. The estimated passive cable length of a HDMI 2.1 signal to get 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth is two to three meters of cable. This one here we've got running is a five meter cable. This is not going to be possible to get an 8K or 10K picture across HDMI 2.1. We're going to have very short cables, be aware. And that's essentially why Bluestream exists. We're here to design and develop solutions to enable you to distribute HDMI longer than th two to three meters and we'll have solutions available when HDMI 2.1 becomes available um, to assist you. So how has HDMI done this? Well, they've done it in two ways. 
One, they've essentially repurposed some, some wires inside the HDMI cable. So previously we had three data channels. HDMI 2.1 will bring with it four data channels. So an extra data channel. Previously, each one of those data channels was six gig per second. HDMI 2.1 will bring us 12 gigabit per second. And that's how we get our higher 18 gigabit per second of bandwidth. It's literally the amount of data channels times by the bandwidth gives us our total data rate. However, now this is a really interesting point. Some of the resolutions that HDMI 2.1 specifies are actually well outside of the 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth. If we look at 8K resolutions only, there's a divide here down the middle between formats that will fit within our 48 gigabit per second of bandwidth and formats that fall well outside up to four times the amount of bandwidth, five, nearly five times the amount of bandwidth of 48 gigabit per second. So how is HDMI 2.1 going to deal with this? It's, I'll tell you in a moment. If we look at 10K resolution, so well and truly beyond 8K, um, and 10K essentially is, is going to be a wider version of 8K. It won't be any taller, it'll be wider. Um, and 10K actually specifies that the maximum resolution is 10K, 120 frames, 444, 12-bit color space, uh, and that will use a total of 240 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So even the formats that HDMI 2.1 are saying they'll support will not be able to be sent passively over a HDMI cable unless we introduce this compression, this DSC or display stream compression. So HDMI 2.1 will allow a 240 gigabit per second signal to be compressed down to 48 gigabit per second and sent over a HDMI 2 to 3 meter cable. One advantage that HDMI 2.1 will bring with it um, is in the way that it will handshake. If ever you've had handshaking problems before, HDMI 2.1 tries to resolve these handshaking problems. Um, it does it in a few ways. It's essentially checking to make sure that the bandwidth is available between the source and the display. So previously, if a TV said, I support um, 4K, a source device will output 4K. If I'm using an old HDMI cable, if I'm using a distribution method that doesn't support 4K, I'm not going to get a picture simple as that. However, HDMI 2.1 will look into that more in depth and actually look at the bandwidth and say, okay, you can't actually support the bandwidth that a 4K signal requires. I'm going to either compress the picture or request a lower resolution picture. So very, very clever. And this is going to help immensely in any handshake problems due to resolution or due to bandwidth. So really good feature coming. The basic summary is you will definitely require third party solutions to distribute HDMI 2.1 more than two or three meters. And that's, as I said, why Bluestream exists. We'll have solutions available for you. Just to give you an idea of the bandwidth requirements, a 1080p picture has two million pixels on the screen. A 4K picture has eight million pixels on the screen and an 8K picture is going to step up to 33 million pixels. So the increase is exponential. It's a quadrupling of pixels as we step up in, in resolutions. Just to give you an idea of some of the other features that uh, affect um, bandwidth, and you've probably all seen this before, so I'll touch on it very quickly. HDR actually brings to it um, uh, increased bandwidth, and it does that in several ways. So on the left here is the amount of color and contrast that the human eye can see. On the right here is the amount of uh, color and contrast that a standard dynamic range or uh, older panels can display. It's a very small amount or small subset of what the human eye can see. Stepping up to HDR gives us a much greater color and contrast, um, or gives the display device much greater color and con contrast to display real colors. Be aware, this does come with a large bandwidth increase of SDR. So HDR is broken down into two, two, two main factors, contrast and color. Um, color is defined by the color gamut. So the outside circle, or the outside oval here shape, um, is the amount of color that the human eye can see. Rec 709 is essentially standard dynamic range, and that's this yellow triangle here. Uh, Rec 2020 is HDR, uh, um, 
uh, and it's represented by this black triangle here. So you can see there's a large increase in the amount of colour that HDR displays can represent. Colour depth is also known as bit depth and it's the amount of bits in the actual data bits um, that are available to describe and represent colours. In the, in the way of SDR standard dynamic range, this is represented by 8-bit. And if you remember those pixels I mentioned before, each pixel has to be re represented by a colour. A colour is made up by an RGB, a red, a green and a, and a blue. And basically an LED display will have one of each of those um, LEDs per pixel. Oh, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, so an 8-bit colour depth can display a total of 16 million colours. So each one of those pixels on the screen can display 8 million colours. If we step up to 10-bit or HDR10, um, we increase that to 1 billion colours, a massive increase. And have you heard of Dolby Vision? Yeah, Dolby Vision steps that up even further um, to 12-bit and allows 68 billion colours to be represented on the screen. What I'm trying to get at here is as we step up the bit depth uh, and the amount of colours that we can display, we increase the bandwidth required massively. The amount of bandwidth between 8-bit and 12-bit is huge. If you haven't seen a HDR display, um, go, and, go and check one out in your showroom, calibrate it and compare it to an older display. You'll see a huge difference. Um, I'm sure you've all also heard of colour space. I'm only going to touch on this very briefly. Normally I'd go further in depth with this, but we have 444 colour space, 422, 420. Um, these define how colour is represented on a screen based on three, three features, a luma channel and two colour channels. I won't go too in depth, suffice to say, uh, to show you a comparison between 444 colour space and 420 colour space. Um, 444 colour space basically means that every single pixel on a screen is represented by its own individual colour. 420 essentially is, every, uh, is one quarter of the amount of pixels on a display are represented by their own colour. So you can see here this is the same, almost the same as, as looking at a 1080p picture on a 4K screen in terms of the amount of colour information. One thing, however, it's important to note is, is, I'll just take a step back, is to look at the specification for a 4K Blu-ray. A 4K Blu-ray, the content, the media stored on a 4K Blu-ray is actually only stored in 420 colour space. It's only stored with a quarter of the colour information on the disc itself. Any Blu-ray player that's saying it outputs 444 is actually internally upscaling a 420 picture because the content, the media, is only 420. So why not use 444? Well, the biggest reason is bandwidth. 444 takes up a larger amount of bandwidth than 420. And Blu-rays are limited to a, to a physical, uh, uh, physical size. However, there is a lot of science, a lot of engineering going into why um, the Blu-ray consortium have come up with 420 color space. You've, you may have all seen this before, but if not, I'll take you through it. Um, just please stare at the star in the middle for a second. There's no fancy trickery behind this. All I'm going to do is change to the next slide. So stare at the, the star in the middle. And now the slide you see, do you see it in colour? I'll go back and do it again. Stare at the, the star in the middle for a second. Do you see the slide in colour? And look away for a second and look black. That's the black and white image. It's not a colour image. This is a reaction called after image. Uh, this is a mixture of a photochemical reaction in the retina of the eye and the negative of an image. And essentially what I'm trying to explain is that the human eye may not necessarily be able to see the difference between a 444 color space and 420. And that's why Blu-ray have decided to go with this specification. On top of that, when you're watching a video, a, a movie at up to 60 frames per second, that picture is updating 60 times per second. Your eye won't necessarily pick up the colour difference between 420 and 444 when actually watching a movie. So it's an interesting point that Blu-ray have gone with a lesser format, um, but the compromise to picture is absolutely minuscule. There's not a huge difference. So keep this in mind as we talk about compression or ways of distributing larger formats of signals. Um, colour space conversion may be a good way, or reducing the colour space may be a good way of distributing video. So be aware, HDMI is a digital signal, obviously, um, and when using distribution signals, your goal should be to try and 
and, and have as little signal loss as possible throughout the entire system. We'll look at some real world bandwidths here. So we have 1080p sources traditionally like your Foxtel box, a set top box, which don't actually use up a huge amount of bandwidth. Um, they might use up about five gigabit per second. We have 18 gigabit per second um, over a HDMI 2.0 cable. So they don't stress a HDMI cable too much. Our 4K Blu-ray sits in about here, 10.2 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So actually it doesn't use the full bandwidth that an 18 gigabit per second cable can take. There are only a few native sources um, that can actually deal with 18 gigabit per second of bandwidth. And these are things like your 4K Xbox, PlayStation, when you're gaming. They can output the full 18 gigabit per second. A lot of Blu-rays will internally upscale from an 11 gig Blu-ray to 18 gig. They'll, they'll upscale from 420 to 444. They won't natively, the, the media isn't natively um, 18 gigabit per second. So just something to be aware of. And just to give you uh, an, an idea of the bandwidth difference between um, old, really old displays, um, when HDMI was first introduced at 5 gig, HDMI 1.3 introduced 10 gig and HDMI 2.0 introduced 18 gig. So how do we distribute HDMI? Before today, passive cables would allow us to distribute 18 gig up to about 18, uh, so up to about 5 meters. We would need to do something to reduce the bandwidth. Now, a scaler could be one option. We can have our full 18 gigabit per second picture coming in, and we could use color space conversion, converting 444 to 420 to make it fit within a 10 gig bandwidth requirement. That's one option. The other option is for EDID management. So what is EDID management? Um, EDID management is essentially telling a source that I want, to out, I want you to output a lower specification, a lower resolution or a higher resolution depending on your, your needs. So Bluestream products all feature EDID management. I can tell the, the Blu-ray to output 4K 42060 or 10 gigabit per second of bandwidth um, HDMI signal so that I can transmit it over HD base T to my display. And that works perfectly fine. So when you're designing your, your customer systems, it's important to note do they need future proofing, which I'd always recommend, um, and look at what's currently in their system. So older HDMI cables cannot deal with the bandwidth. A customer might say, yeah, I've already got a cable run, I won't bother getting a new cable. It may not be suitable to get 18 gigabit per second of bandwidth. We don't recommend you join HDMI cables. This creates a lot of loss and keep the number of HDMI distribution products to a minimum. Um, each product essentially creates loss. The fewer you have, the more integrity that HDMI signal keeps. This is a really important point. A lot of people don't understand the limitations of passive HDMI cables. A 20 meter HDMI, passive HDMI cable cannot send a 4K signal. It cannot, it does not have the bandwidth required. You'd be dumbfounded at how many calls I get. A customer just bought a latest 4K um, Apple TV and the latest 4K Sony projector, perhaps Epson projector, and they cannot get a signal over a 15 or 20 meter Bluestream cable from their source device to their projector. It is not possible. It doesn't support 18 gig of bandwidth. It's not possible. Simple as that. Um, we recommend uh, uh, about 12 meters for a 10 gig 4K signal and about 5 meters for an 18 gig 4K signal. Beyond that, you really struggle. You need another distribution method. So how do we distribute 4K 60Hz 444? How do we distribute 18 gig signal? I'm pleased to announce to you Bluestream have a solution. Um, we've just introduced a new product range of precision 18 gigabit per second cables, guaranteed to give you 18 gig from half a meter up to 100 meters over a single cable. There's three products in this lineup. One is our passive cables from half a meter to seven meters. And these essentially use brute force. The thicker you get, uh, the, the longer you get, the thicker you get, the more copper, uh, the heavier the cable. The active cables use a pretty complex chipset in the display end of the cable. So they do become directional, but that's for 10, 15, and 20 meters. And for 30 meters uh, to 100 meters, so in 30, 50, or 100 meters, we use, um, what's called active optic copper. And these are available in stock today. You have them in your warehouse. 
Um, this is actually a fiber optic cable, okay? It has fiber optic for sending the data, the high bandwidth signal. All the video is sent over fiber optic. It also has internally um, eight copper lines for sending the HDCP handshake and the HDMI handshake, the DDC signal. So it uses the best of both technologies. Because they're designed to be pulled through a wall, we have a detachable connector. So you can easily pull this through a 20 millimeter conduit um, and your customers can pull it through their jobs um, fairly simply. So I'll pass that through for you guys to have a look at. Um, it has been designed to be pulled through from um, your source equipment through to your display. So generally from your rack area through to your display area. Just, just uh, point out to the when pulling, you don't pull from the off the pipe. Correct. You pull pull from the cable. Because the pipe doesn't have the same force. Correct. So we do, we do actually include. It comes with a little sheath, and if you're pulling. Um, tape around that sheath to help relieve some of the strain from the connector itself. So tape that along the, the cable itself. So always pull from the cable. From the cable. Just to give you an idea of some technology that goes into this, um, there is electronic circuitry active chipset in the head of each of these the active connectors. Um, and we do use what we call a full metal shield or full metal jacket um, around the connectors to help reduce EMI uh, and keep signal integrity. We also are introducing some new technologies for distributing 18 gigabit per second over HT base T. These are called, oh, first import, important point, HT base T is limited to 10 gig per second of bandwidth. This is an industry wide limitation. Um, Valens, the chipset producer, uh, uh, only support 10 gig per second of bandwidth. So Bluestream products will feature CSC color space conversion or DSC display stream compression and I mentioned DSC before, this is also the compression technology that HDMI are adopting to allow you to send 18 gig over HD base T. So how is it going to do that? Well, you'll have your 18 gig signal coming into your transmitter. Your transmitter will do either DSC or CSC conversion, transmit that over HD base T, do the reverse DSC or CSC conversion and output 18 gigabit per second at the end. So I'll explain this shortly as we get to um, the HD base T technology. The important thing to take away from this, cable bandwidth is key. Cable bandwidth is the killer of video signals and the reason why we get dropouts. So be aware of this or we don't get a picture at all. So that's the important thing. And HDMI 2.1 is going to stress bandwidth and cabling even further. Any questions there on HDMI? Yep. So up to 5 to 7 meters they'll do 18 gigabit per second. Beyond that they will, they will not handle the bandwidth, they're just passive cables. So 1 to 5 meters no problems whatsoever. Um, maybe you mentioned before I just got the data, but um, what should be frame rate limitation on HDMI? Um, 120 hertz. 120 hertz. Yep. So HDMI 2.0 will bring greater frame rates which is great if you're a gamer. Yeah. Um, all right, any other questions? All right, we'll move on to HD base T. Um, I won't bore you too much with HD base T. I'm sure you've all gone through it before. Um, it's obviously a, a, a method for distributing um, HDMI audio video over CAT cable. The benefits of it obviously uncompressed video up until today and um, only. Uh, minimal amount of latency up to 10 milliseconds. Designed to send audio, video, ethernet control power over CAT cable up to 10.2 gigabit per second and also send back audio, ethernet and control. Again I reiterate it is limited to 2.2 gigabit per second of bandwidth. So how do we send then an 18 gig signal over a 10 gig pipeline? The first and simplest way, and this is what we've been doing up until now, is to use EDID management built into the Bluestream product to limit the resolution, limit the data being sent. So we'd set the EDID in our matrix. It'll request that the source sends out a 4K 420. It will send over HD base T and your TV will receive. Very, very simple. 
Now we have two new technologies. We have CSC or color space sampling, uh, color space conversion. And essentially what that does, your source device will output 4K6444. The transmitter will accept this signal and it will convert from 444 to 420. It will then transmit that over HD base T and at the receiver end, it will convert from 422 back up to 444 color space. So it will then give you an 18 gig signal going to your TV. That's color space conversion. DSC or display stream compression is the next option. And it really is, it's identical in the way it works. Um, your 4K 18 gig signal gets transmitted, the transmitter picks it up and it uses DSC or display stream compression to reduce that signal down to 10 gig. Transmits that over HD base T, it uncompresses it at the receiver end and sends an 18 gig signal to your display. So DSC compression is considered visually lossless. To the human eye, you don't notice a difference. So you're all probably asking, well, what does it look like? Here's an example and, and, and a comparison between, between the two. So here's an example comparing um, the difference between DSC and CSC. On the left here, we have the original image. On the right here, we have the image um, after a product, uh, a signal has gone through DSC compression and decompression. And then here we have one that's gone through uh, CSC color space conversion and then back. So DSC actually does very, very little to the actual video picture. These little blue marks are a minor uh, difference between the original source, device, uh, source signal and the, uh, the compressed and then decompressed signal. CSC, on the other hand, does introduce a little bit more um, artifacts or a little bit more color loss compared to DSC. Here's another example. Um, just showing the difference. You've got the original here, DSC, and then CSC. So there is a slight difference between them. Um, DSC is technically a superior format, but in most instances, CSC is not going to be any issues whatsoever. You won't see any, any <coughs> real-world issues. I just want to cover now some HD based T best practices. This is more just to reiterate the point um, that you've probably already heard before. So it's important to be aware of what equipment is in a job, and what equipment um, uh, the customer already has and what you specify because you will run into problems if you have mismatches in resolution supported in HDCP or HDMI version supported and we're going to see probably more issues when we move to HDMI 2.1. So be aware if, if you want to get a 4K signal across and you don't want to see picture dropping out, all of your TVs need to support 4K or you need to accommodate some sort of scaling methodology as well. So just be aware of that. Um, cable maintenance. Don't untwist cables unnecessarily and it may be preferred to use shielded cables as they're less prone to EMI. Your mileage may vary. In some instances you may decide not to. Use the best quality LAN cable possible. Um, in pre-existing jobs you may find you want to use the pre-existing cabling. It may not be able to deal with the bandwidth requirements if it's old Cat5 or, or previous cabling. Um, we recommend Cat5e, Cat6, Cat6a. Um, handle your cat cables with care. Be aware of minimum bend radiuses and don't pull on them too tightly. Keep cat cables away from power lines um, and anything that can cause EMI and don't make spaghetti out of your cables. Run them neatly. Uh, monitor cable distances. This is an important one. Um, we offer two ranges or two chipsets in our uh, HDMI, uh, HD based T products. One is a Class A chipset that will send HDMI 1080p up to 100 meters and 4K up to 70 meters. The other is 1080p up to 70 meters and 4K up to 40 meters. There is quite a hard cutoff beyond this length, so be aware of that. We cannot send it further than that. Um, do not use patch panels, wall plates or joiners uh, in your jobs. We estimate that they take off the equivalent of 5 to 10 meters of bandwidth. If you've got our 40 metre kit and you're trying to get 10, uh, 4K at 40 metres, you've got a patch panel at each end, there's 10 metres to 20 metres cut off straight away. So please be aware of this. Um, it's a common issue. So terminate point to point. 
HD base T is not Ethernet. Do not connect it into a network switch. Do not connect it into a PoE injector. They are completely different. And terminate your ca cables carefully. We do recommend the 568B standard um, because the twist ratio of the pairs allows for better EMI, better noise rejection. Please test your cables. Now, a lot of you guys will have seen um, continuity testers. These are great to make sure the pinouts are correct. Unfortunately, they don't do anything to tell you that a cable is actually capable of taking 10 gig of bandwidth. There are some expensive 10 gig cable testers available. Um, we're looking at bringing in our own um, to offer you guys uh, this one here, which allows you to test HD based T products, HD based T cabling very, very simply just by plugging it in. And in house, we have these nice, fancy quantum data products. Unfortunately, they're about 15 grand each as well. They do work really well. We don't expect you guys to keep them on hand. So, just important to test your cabling to make sure it can actually deal with 10 giga bandwidth. Any questions there on the HD base T section? All right, I'll move on to understanding video over IP and the Bluestream multicast system. I'm not going to get too technical on this because um, I think you guys have probably seen this before. Essentially, it's a, a, the Bluestream multicast product is a way of sending audio video signals over a typical layer three managed gigabit network. Some of the key features are virtually unlimited system size. Um, you're literally only limited by your network infrastructure. I mentioned the Olympic job earlier where we had 100 transmitters and 800 receivers. That's a massive job, 900 endpoints uh, over a typical layer three managed data network. Having said that, the network backbone was what you typically see at an ISP, not in a customer's house. But you do not need to get that fancy for your residential jobs. Um, our Bluestream receivers have scaling built into them. What does this mean? If you've got a mismatch of 4K and 1080p screens in your job, you can have all your sources output the best resolution output 4K and the scaling built into the receiver can convert that to 1080p for the screens that need it. So you don't need any additional scaling products. Um, Multi-pass products can be located anywhere in the job. You can have a receiver unit or transmitter unit put in a, a cabinet somewhere with a Foxtel box hidden away or you can have all your equipment back at the rack um, or you could put it up behind a projector wherever you need uh, as long as you've got cat cabling run to it. Um, less bandwidth required. So we're sending our video over a one gig data network, not over a 10 gig data network. So we're not stretching the cable as much. We are using compression to do this. Virtually latency free, one frame of latency. So almost as good as HD base T, uh, minimal, minimal uh, latency there. And we support 4K HDR, HDCP 2.2, um, all of that. Because our products have scaling built in, they can also feature video wall functionality without any additional hardware required. So let's say I've got a three by three video wall. Um, I can automatically scale a picture to be sent to that three by three video wall. I could also set up inside that a two by two video wall and have the outside five screens displaying completely different sources. It's entirely possible. Also feature bi-directional IR232 and IP control. PoE, so I only need the one cable to power everything, uh, and EDID management is built into every transmitter. So typically an installation will feature uh, one transmitter product um, per, um, per source device, one receiver product per, um, per display, so each TV in your video wall would have its own receiver, and each projector, each other TV in your job would have its own receiver. You'll have one of our control modules, our CM100, also in the job, um, and I'll explain this a moment, uh, in, in a moment. Essentially, it's, it's the way that your external control systems all control our system. We recommend a layer three managed network switch. We do not recommend you use the customer's data switch or the customer's network. We recommend you specify your own. Few reasons for this. One is that we are sending a lot of bandwidth over our switch. We don't ever want an instance where the bandwidth required by our switch or our system interferes with the customer's data network or vice versa. The customer's downloading impacts on our data network or our video network. Um, this way you should have less service calls and less headaches. 
Also, you do not need to be a network engineer, you do not need to be an IT technician to set up the network switch. You do not need to know about VLANs, there is no complicated setup. You can set our system up via VLANs if you want to. We don't necessarily recommend it. And network switches aren't terribly expensive. Um, we also, obviously, everything is connected by CAT cable. So just while you're passing the transmitter and receiver around, I'll just go through some of the features of each of those. We have some uh, buttons on the front panel to allow you to configure the device. We have an LCD to allow you to see what, uh, what source is currently being viewed on a receiver or what is currently what the ID of the current transmitter is. A LAN port for PoE and for sending the data to it. Uh, HDMI input, bi-directional IR, bi-directional 232 and a line input that you can embed external audio over the transmitter. The receiver looks very very similar. Buttons, uh, sorry, bi-directional IR and 232. Buttons to configure the thing, an LCD panel. Uh, PoE LAN, so you can power and send video to the device. A LAN loop out, and I'll get to why that's useful um, in a moment. HDMI output uh, that gets connected to your displays, and analog audio output. Jumping back to our CM100 or our control module. Um, so, the, the, the beauty of this or the purpose behind this, I mentioned before, we recommend keeping the Bluestream multicast network completely separate to the customer's network. This is the product that allows you to bridge those two networks so you can still control the system, but it is completely independent from the rest of the, the, the customer's network. So essentially there's an imaginary divide between our video LAN port, so this gets connected to our, our own our video network switch, and the control port, the customer's network switch. They're completely independent. Um, so we internally manage the video side and then the customer's network or the control network is on this side. You can also control the system by IR, 232 or IP. So the system can be configured in four ways. One is as a typical matrix where every source device can be sent to any receiver or, multi or multiples thereof. You can also use it in video or presentation mode as I mentioned. You can use it as a one-to-one -one extender. And there's very few use cases where I'd recommend that you use it as a one-to-one. -one. I'd nearly always recommend you use a HD-based T solution instead of the IP solution in that instance. You can also use it in a one-to-many scenario. So I mentioned the loop out port um, on the receivers. If I've got one source that I need to distribute, let's say a Foxtel box in a pub, and I want it to go to multiple displays. I can use that loop out to go from one receiver to the next to the next. It is possible. Thanks. Um, this is a schematic overview of the IP system. Um, on the left you have all your sources. They're all connected to transmitters which then get connected into a network switch. On the right you've got your receivers and each receiver is connected by cat cable and then obviously HDMI into your display and you can set up a video wall as such. You can link and join multiple switches. So that, um, that job we did for the Olympics had a lot of switches um, across various venues and fiber linking the two. If you are using multiple switches, we do recommend fiber links between the two switches because you do need to deal with all of the bandwidth being transmitted by a transmitter. So a transmitter can transmit at max for a 4K input signal at uh, one gig of data. And for a 1080p input signal, 500 megabit per second of data. So you need to make sure if I've got three 4K sources, that's three gig of bandwidth that I need to be transmitting between my two switches. Some of the technologies that we use or the multicast requires from your switch are things like IGMP snooping, jumbo frames and multicast. I'm not going to bore you with the technicalities behind this. Um, suffice to say we have a lot of manuals written and a lot of switches, common use switches, um, we support and we've tested. So we, this, this list is available on our website and we have set up guides for these switches on our website. So, the technical side of it, do you need to understand it to set up a system? The short answer is no, you do not. You do not need to be a network engineer. You do not need to be technically inclined. We have very, very, very straightforward step-by-step -step guides uh, and video um, walkthroughs for some of our network switch setup guides. Very, very simple. We also have very straightforward PC setup software. And we've got a new software coming uh, probably the middle of next month, um, which will make it even simpler once again. And 
to configure the products, you can also do it via the front buttons. There's two buttons on the front panel. So what we're trying to show you or get across is that it's a very, very simple system to set up. If you want to see it set up, we can organize a time and, and we can do that uh, outside of today. But it's really, really simple, not complicated at all. There are a lot of different video over IP solutions available in the market. Um, some we're happy to admit are better. They generally fall into this category here where you require a 10 gig network. What does that mean? You're now running fiber between your network switch and all of your endpoints. Um, you now need a 10 gig network switch, which is considerably more expensive, um, and even running fiber is more expensive. So there are, there are 10 gig solutions available. They, they allow for higher bandwidth, but they, they do come with a much higher cost as well. We've found that the solution that Bluestream have gone with offers the best compromise between video performance, so that's our key focus, video performance, and latency. Um, and we have the absolute minimal latency possible. Quick comparison between Bluestream Multicast and HD Base T. So Multicast uh, works over a one gig network, so a lot less stress on the cable itself. Um, virtually unlimited system size, any number of transmitters or receivers only limited by your system's network, can support HDR, has built-in scaling, um, and cost effective, it really does become cost effective for larger installations beyond 8x8s. Advantages of HD Base T, up until DSC and CSC, there was no video compression, so it's a completely uncompressed signal, better picture quality. Much more cost effective um, for smaller installations. So 4x4, 8x8, typically you're going to find a, a HD based T matrix more cost effective and supports some unique features like ARC and Ethernet pass through. Similarities between the two they both distribute 4K 6420, 4K 3444. They're both virtually latency free or worst case one frame. EDID management built in, HTCP 2.2, and bi directional IR and RS232. Any questions there on the multicast system? All right, good. We're getting through this quite quickly. So if you've got any questions, just slow me down. So now I want to take you through some of the, the, the new Bluestream products coming. And there is quite a large lineup of Bluestream products. Um, hopefully you're all aware that we have typically three ranges of products. We have our entry level, our contractor range of products our essentials range or our mid-tier products and our platinum range or our premium products. Um, in this instance we're, we're releasing some contract or entry level matrix products. A 4x4 HDMI matrix and a 4x2 HDMI matrix at a much more entry level price point than our current affordings. So what's different? Um, unfortunately I don't have a picture but the front panel is different. If you've seen our C44 matrix, and I'll take you through this in a second, we've simplified the front panel dramatically. There's no LCD on the front panel, there's just a push button for each source. Typically a customer is not going to go to an equipment rack to change source. They're going to use a control system or a remote control. So we've removed that functionality because it's not useful to an end consumer. We've also removed the web GUI because we expect this is going to be used either with a control system or by IR. There is RS232 as well. Um, 4 HDMI in, 4 HDMI out, <laughs> IR pass through with routing so you can still route your sources and um, audio breakout as well and then the 4x2 under that. <laughs> Some scaling products, if you haven't seen these get on board they're really really useful in um, installations where you've got 1080p screens and 4K screens or 1080p screens and 4K content. We have two options available, um, the SC11 and the SC12. The current products we have are HDMI 1.4, the new products are HDMI 2.0 and 18 gigabit per second. Essentially how these work, there's two options. The SC11 is one in one out. So you feed it a 4K signal and out the output it downscales out to 1080p. Great for for 1080p screens um, don't support 4K. We also have a one in two out option. So you feed your 4K in, one out is uh, bypass, so it'll output 4K. The second out is downscale and will downscale that to 1080p. So have a look at that. Um, we also have some really handy HDMI troubleshooting products. The SM11 I'll take you through shortly, but I recommend you always keep an SM11 on hand. We'll get your installers to do that. Looking at our HD Base T matrix lineup, 
You've all used our essential HMXL44 before, I've got no doubt. Um, because we're seeing an introduction of CSC or color space conversion, uh, we'll be introducing a HMXL44 CS and this will feature that color space conversion built in. So it'll support 18 gigabit per second signals. Looking at the back of it, it is very, very similar to a HMXL44. The difference being we only have HDMI loop out on one output instead of all four outputs. So we've simplified, uh, we've simplified that there. Hopefully you've all seen our contractor C44 matrix. We launched this at Integrate last year, um, so about November. Um, it's our entry level uh, contractor ranger matrix products. As you can see from the front panel, it's much more simplistic. No, no complicated um, menu system, just a push button to change source. The back panel we've also simplified. So we've removed a few non-essential um, features that in typical installations your customers won't be using. So four HDMI inputs, IR routing, um, one HDMI loop out, so you can send that to your local projector or AV receiver, and four HD base C loop outs. So features we've received, uh, received, removed compared to HMXL, no audio breakout, and no RS-232 pass-through. If you need those features specifically, you step up to the HMXL. It does still have the exact same web GUI um, and app control, and it comes with four Hex 70B receivers. And that's two and a half grand retail. So a very cost-effective price point. We're also introducing new Hex kits. So you've probably all used our Hex 70B or Hex 70ED. Um, with the addition of these new technologies, CSC and DSC, we'll bring out kits that support these. So there's a, there's a Hex 70 CS kit, and if you've used our Hex 70 ED, it looks identical. The only difference is it supports CSC or supports 18 gig per second video coming in. So no longer do we need or EDID management, or we may not need EDID management. It still is on there, um, but we will accept a full 18 gig signal. We have a Hex 100 CS kit, and this looks identical to the 70 CS. The difference is um, this allows 4K up to 70 meters, or 1080p up to 100 meters. The Hex 70 CS kit only allows 4K up to 40 meters, or 1080p up to 70 meters. So you gain extra range, uh, extra distance by stepping up to this model. The next model in the lineup is the Hex 150 DSC. So now we implement that DSC or display stream compression technology for slightly better picture quality. Um, this will also feature a, a mode called long reach when it's, when it's released by Valens. And it allows um, a 1080p picture up to actually 150 meters and 4K picture up to uh, uh, 100 meters. So we're getting even further range using the long reach mode. So that's fantastic there. It also features ARC, audio return channel, and ethernet. So when you enable that long reach mode, some of those features will be deactivated. Our custom pro matrix, if you haven't seen this before, essentially this is the matrix that you specify specifically for your job. So we've got a large range of inputs and output cards depending on your requirements. Just to note, the current range of uh, inputs and output cards are all HDMI 1.4 or HDCP 1.4. We have a new range coming uh, in the next month or two, which is the full HDMI 2.0 or 18 gigabit per second of uh, bandwidth. I won't bore you too much with the nitty gritty of each one, but I will take you an overview of the matrix. So you buy the matrix as a hub, as an empty shell. It comes preloaded with the web GUI card, the IP IR control card. So this is built in. If you need RS-232 pass-through in your job, then you specify the RS-232 card. If you don't need it, you don't specify it. If you need audio breakout, you specify the audio breakout card. If you don't need it, you don't specify it. If you need IR pass-through, then you specify the card. If you don't need it, you don't specify it. So a good way of making a matrix more cost-effective uh, if you're not using all the features of, say, a platinum matrix. There are also two input card slots. Uh, each input card is either a two or four inputs, and they can either be HDMI, VGA, or HD base T. So a total of eight inputs there. We also have two output slots, and again, they come in lots of two or four, so up to eight outputs total, and those eight outputs can be HDMI or HD base T, or you can have simultaneous HDMI and HD base T out of the one output. 
and we'll have cards available that support DSC and CSC in the future. So all that new technology is filtering into this as well. We also have our Platinum range of Matrix. If you haven't seen this yet, this is the granddaddy with all the bells and whistles. There are essentially, uh, or there's four models, whether you need an 8x8 matrix or whether you need a 6x6 matrix, and that delves down into two options. One, if you need ARC or if you need extra distance. So the ARC model gives you audio return channel and gives you 100 meters at 1080p or 70 meters at 4K. Um, the 66, uh, sorry, the L model, the light model, gives you the Class B chipset and gives you 4K up to 40 meters and 1080p up to 70 meters. So the beauty about this product is that it has a complete standalone audio matrix within the HDMI matrix. So what do I mean by that? My HDMI or HD base T input, that's one input. I can take that audio source and route it independently. I also have an analog audio input. I can route that independently. I also have an ARC audio input, so that's three, input, three inputs per input, three audio inputs per, per slot, and I can route them all independently. And that's independently to the HDMI or HD base T out, as well as the analog left, right, or coaxial out. So I suddenly have a very flexible audio matrix inside my video matrix that can be independent. So I can distribute, let's say, a Helios multi-room system anywhere in the house very, very simply with this. This is a really handy product as well. This is our HD base T splitter. One HDMI input and one HDMI output. So you can loop this out either to another one of these units or to an AV receiver. It also has four HD base T outputs. Um, so this is great in pubs or clubs where you've got one source, maybe a set-top box, a Foxtel box that needs to go to many TVs. Uh, you could definitely use something like this, bi-directional IR so you can still control the product and EDID management as well as audio breakout. Um, we have two alternate distribution products. One I'm going to touch on very, very quickly, and one of them is actually really cool. The EX40B kit is a very inexpensive way of distributing uh, video. It only supports 1080p. It does have latency. It does need to be powered at both ends. I'd highly recommend that you spec a HD base T product over this. We do have it if money is the absolute primary concern. The CEX120B is a fantastic product and designed as, let's say, a get out of jail free card. If you've got a pre-existing house that already has coaxial cable run, you can specify one of these instead of a cat-based product, and you can run HDMI up to 1080p over your coaxial cable RG59, uh, RG6. So be aware of that. This is a great option uh, in those instances. <coughs> we also have some, altern uh, some audio distribution products. Our Cat100 is a fantastic product. I'll take you through that in a second. Essentially, it's an it's a audio over... Um, audio of the cat cable distribution product and we have some DACs and ADCs and digital converters there as well to suit your jobs. Now this is something I'm incredibly proud to announce. This has been a long term coming, long time coming. Um, Bluestream are now officially a licensed Dolby and DTS licensee. What does that mean? Well two things. One, we've handed over a large wad of cash to become authorised, and it has, it's, it's no, no cheap feat, I'll let you know that. Uh, the other thing it means is we can now develop products that have Dolby DTS down mixing built into them. What does that mean? Well, um, all Bluestream products currently, if you've used the uh, analog audio output, they will only work if you have a two-channel PCM signal coming in. If you've got a multi-zone, uh, sorry, a multi, um, channel signal like a Dolby or DTS signal, you will not get an analog audio output. What does it mean? Well, if you've got an AV receiver and you're listening to 7.1 in the main zone, you can also distribute that main zone, that 7.1 signal to any other TV, any other room in the house and have Bluestream product down convert the audio to two channel so that it will work on all the TVs, on two channel equipment, on multi-room systems. So. Um, for us, that's a really big feature, and we'll be bringing out um, standalone options, so standalone fiber, uh, uh, optic DAC first, and then a HDMI DAC, and then we'll look at implementing it in our Platinum Ranger products and also IP products. Some other solutions that Bluestream has available, um, maybe more so for commercial space. We have an MX44 video wall. 
This is a really cost effective way of building a 2x2 video wall. Four HDMI inputs, four VGA inputs, and your four HDMI outputs. Um, very cost effective way of a 2x2, 1x4, or it also has a multi view mode so it can do picture in picture um, internally and you can output this either to the video wall or to a single source, a single output, I should say. These are all predefined, but great in a pub or club where you've got uh, your main video and maybe you want the betting results inside that or another channel inside that. So very flexible there. Um, we also have what we call some multi-format presenters. If your customers are stuck in the dark ages and they're still using component or composite video or VGA for that matter, we can upscale or up convert them to HDMI and the MFP72 will allow you to do that. If you need more inputs, so you, you may need more VGA inputs, HD base T inputs or outputs, we have a larger MFP112 as well. Um, this is great if you've got customers doing boardrooms, classrooms, universities, something like this behind a lectern, um, behind a wall plate is perfect. We'll support any format, uh, any of these formats available. I covered the video over IP products, um, so there's our transmitter and our receiver just to give you an idea of how they cost in comparison to a matrix. We are also looking at bringing out an ACM100 or an advanced control module. This is for the IP system. Um, our current CM100 is a fairly dumb product, I'll be honest. It doesn't really have any brains in it. Our ACM100 is going to bring some processing internal into the processor. And it's going to allow some cool features. We're going to bring out what we call our drag and drop uh, TV app. And you'll be able to see in real time the current video or current picture from your sources and current uh, settings of all of your displays. This is awesome if you're in a pub or a club where you can't see the displays but you want to change sources and make sure they're on the right thing. Um, so this, the, the image will update every few seconds to show you live information, um, iOS and Android app and we're looking at remote access as well. So we've currently, we're currently developing this as we speak and this will be available in the next quarter or so. I mentioned the Bluestream uh, HDMI cable products so I'll just reiterate three ranges in that lineup. Passive cables from half a metre to seven metres, um, active cables from 10 metres to 20 metres, and AOC or active optic copper cables from 30 metres to 100 metres. And they will all come in a nice, nicer box than what Bluestream typically have provided, um, just so you can put them on the retail floor and have them look quite good. We have some old, uh, uh, accessory products as well, um, some rack mounting products. These were designed with our IP multicast products in mind, but they're perfect for rack mounting any other product. 6RU in height, um, great for set top boxes, things like that as well. And a bunch of other IR accessories, USB cables as well. I'll just mention one point if you're not aware of it. Bluestream IR devices are all 5 volt. So a lot of products we integrate into are 12 volt. Um, we have an IR cab here which converts from 12 volt to 5 volt to work with those control systems. So just something to be aware of, keep in the back of your mind. This is a HD base T test device that we are looking at bringing in. Um, this is a way of testing to ensure that 10 gig can be sent down a CAT cable. Now, this cable here is marketed as a CAT6 cable. It's a pre-terminated 3 meter cable and it's as good as rubbish. It's from a large chain uh, retail outlet and using this tester we found, oh actually this is a customer in Perth gave this to me, they were having problems with these cables. So using our tester we found it cannot deal with the 10 gig bandwidth required by HD base T. So really important to be aware of um, and this is why we're bringing out, looking at bringing out some test equipment so you can properly test cables. It'll show you the error rate of the cable um, and basically tell you if a 4K signal or 10 gig signal is going to pass over HD base T or not. It'll print a certificate as well to show you you've tested that cable. So, hopefully something that your installers may find useful. Now, a lot of Bluestream products feature iOS, a web GUI and an iOS or Android app. You can grab it from the App Store just, or the, the Play Store, just search Bluestream Matrix. Um, this is great, a great tool you can give to the consumer, the customer, without having to use one of our little credit card remotes. This is probably an easier option. You can view your rooms, you can rename these, and you can choose any sources for any of these rooms, or set predefined presets, good for bars or clubs again. 
You can also limit, uh, you can have multiple users and limit what a user can see or how many zones it can access. So you can give the kids their own app, their own access, and you can have your own access to control the entire house. So that's really handy there as well. Now, I've gone through this really quickly, so I've got some real applications that I want to explain to you. The SM11. This is my favorite Bluestream product. This is it. This is our best troubleshooting product, and I highly recommend that you encourage your installers to all keep one of these in their truck. Um, this has many, many, many cool features. So, have you all heard of the clock stretching issue? This was an issue that came about when we moved from HDMI 1.4 to HDMI 2.0. Essentially, the HDMI handshake um, in HDMI 2.0 has to happen a lot quicker than in HDMI 1.4. Initially, the TV manufacturers took a while to get on board and fix their products to accommodate for this. And that's where our SM11 came into play. Essentially, you put it in between the TV and a distribution product, or sometimes just a TV and a source equipment, and it negotiates the handshake. It completes the HDMI handshake without the TV being involved and it then creates a new HDMI handshake for the TV. So it has a reclocking feature which can eliminate clock stretching issues, can eliminate any handshaking issues um, because of that. So that's a really cool feature. That's one feature of this product. Um, other features are uh, it has HDCP conversion on board. So the first generation of 4K screens all supported HDCP 1.4. The latest generation supports HDCP 2.2. Unfortunately, the latest 4K sources, like your Fetch, your Apple TV, uh, to output a 4K picture will all only work with HDCP 2.2 sources. If you put this device in line, it will allow HDCP conversion, so it will allow it to work with older 4K sources. So that's another feature of this product. Um, other features are EDID management. So we can use this to limit the EDID of a source, limit the output of a source. It also has HDMI embedding. You can take a multi-room audio signal and embed it onto this product so you could have your HEOS multi-room audio playing out of your um, Foxtel, for instance, if you want, for pubs and clubs. Also, audio extract, uh, extraction, you could take the audio out and feed it into a multi-room system. So, a really cool and handy product there. Recommend that all installers keep one in their truck to help troubleshoot problems um, I talked you through all the scaling, um, the SC11 and SC12, so I'll just skip over that quickly. Suffice to say, um, the way it's designed to work, the next lot. So if I've got my 4K content coming in, I can feed 4K out to my main zone screen. It's a 4K screen. My second zone screen is only a 1080p screen. If I sent it a 4K picture, it wouldn't work. If I put one of our scaling products in, it'll scale 4K down to 1080p, and my picture there will get a uh, my screen there will get a picture without a problem. The SC12 works in a similar way, just with the two outputs. So your 4K picture comes in, one output is a bypass, so it'll output the 4K, and one output is 1080p downscaled. You feed them both into your matrix, and depending on what TV or what zone you're in, depends on what input on your matrix you'll select. You'll have a 1080p input and a 4K input. Now. The current version, as I mentioned before, are HDMI 1.4. The new version coming in the next few months are HDMI 2.0 or 18 gig. Cat 100 AU. So this is our digital audio um, distribution product. So great for audio return channel when you need to get audio from a TV back to an AV receiver. We take our digital audio out of our TV, feed that into our transmitter, send that over cat cable up to 300 meters for a 48k signal or 100 meters at 192k and at our receiver end we feed that either digital out into our, our AV receiver or analog audio out as well. Now really really handy product it's only powered at the receiver end apologies that's a receiver picture when it should be a transmitter so it's only powered where your AV gear is so no chunky power supplies behind your TV just a nice small discrete box. Thank you very much for your time. That's my presentation there in a lot quicker than before. But if you've got any questions, please come up and see me. I'll be here for, for a little while anyway. So thank you. Yeah.